Greetings, my friends. To all those that are watching, where we found around this world, I'd like to welcome you to the first part of this series uh, entitled Daniel 3 and its end time fulfillment. And we're going to be taking a look at several aspects of Daniel chapter 3 as it pertains to these last days, especially dealing with the main theme that we find in the book of Daniel. And so we welcome you, hope that you join us for the entire uh, series as we know to be a blessing to you as we shall be taking a look at things that perhaps might be new to you. Perhaps you've not heard before coming out of the book of Daniel. But as always, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get right into the study of God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here, for allowing us, Father God, to dig into your word a little deeper. And Lord, we see all over the world clear signs that we're living in the very last days, clear signs that Jesus is coming soon. And we thank you, Father, for the clarity of your prophetic word that lets us know exactly where we are and what is coming, that we may be prepared to meet you in a very short time. Bless us now, Father God, we pray with your Holy Spirit. Enlighten our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we find that the main theme of the book of Daniel is the deliverance of the people of God from their enemies. And in Daniel chapter 3, we read that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he created a crisis when he erected an image of gold in the province of Babylon and enforcing all to bow down and worship the image. Now, it is quite significant that the command to worship the image that he made is mentioned six times in Daniel chapter 3. And the experience of the three Hebrews when they face death by refusing to obey the decree of the king is typical of the experience through which the believers in the three angels' messages will pass through. For we also will be faced with a very similar crisis of either having to worship the beast in the province of spiritual Babylon or suffer death at the hand of our spiritual Babylonian persecutors in the very end of time. And as in Daniel, we also find that in the book of Revelation, there are exactly six references that are made to the worshiping of the beast and his image. So we find that the deliverance of the people of God in the crisis that is just before us is seen in the typical experience that is recorded in the book of Daniel. So in other words, the, the stories that we find mentioned in the book of Daniel are illustrations of what's going to happen when the prophecies are fulfilled. But in Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, we read the angry statement of the king in Daniel chapter 3, verse 15, where the king says to the Hebrews, Now if you're ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you'll be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So right away, we clearly see that this is a contest between the powers of the gods of Babylon and the power of the God of Israel, the true God of heaven, whose clear and explicit commandment is being set aside by the king of Babylon, whose power is being defied by this earthly king and throwing his people into a tremendous conflict. But to this, the three Hebrews answered in Daniel 3, verse 16 through 18, saying, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. And so we find here that the deliverance which came to these three Hebrews illustrates the manner in which the remnant people, us, will be sustained by the presence of the Lord in the fiery trial that will take place when the powers of earth will combine all their forces for the enforcement of false worship on a false day of rest in defiance of the clear command of God. Now this theme of deliverance is seen by the reaction of the king in Daniel 3 verse 28 where it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So again, we find that the theme of deliverance runs throughout Daniel chapter 3. But not only that, we find that in Daniel chapter 6, we also find illustrated the final deliverance of God's end time remnant people. You see, my friends, we must remember, the book of Daniel is not a book of unrelated events, but it is built according to a plan of development. In the opening verses, we find recorded that the people of God are taken captive into Babylon. Babylon, who, who just destroyed their nation, their city, burned down their temple, and they're taken captive. And so in the very beginning, we find that there's a conflict introduced. A conflict between the forces of Babylon and the people of Israel. A conflict between the gods of Babylon and the God of Israel. And the book depicts the struggle down through the centuries between the forces of good and evil involving the true system of mediation and worship until the final crisis over the Sabbath at the very end of time. Similarly, the deliverances recorded in the book of Daniel are cumulative and find their worldwide counterpart in the final deliverance of the people of God. Now the plot of Daniel's enemy, enemies in Daniel 6 to persuade the king to pass a law that will force Daniel to have to choose between obedience to God's law or the law of the state will have its double application or its anti fulfillment when the apostate churches will look to government help to enforce Sunday observance or more commonly as we call them, Sunday laws. And just as a king did not see the subtly and cunning be behind the request of Daniel's enemies, so will it be in the last days when many lawmakers will not discern the cunning behind the appeal to the state to pass laws that will bring spiritual Israel into the most trying of circumstances. But again, we find the theme of deliverance in Daniel 6, verse 14. The Bible says, Daniel 6, verse 14, Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. Verse 16, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And we know the story. The king spent all night pacing back and forth. 
And verse 19 says, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God, whom you serve continually, able to deliver you from the lions? And when the king saw the power of God to deliver Daniel from the lions, notice what the king said in verse 27. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, and has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And many more examples could be given. But the point is that the final deliverance of the people of God to which the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation point to is foreshadowed in the earlier deliverances recorded in the book of Daniel. The three Hebrews, they trusted in God to deliver them. And the Lord walked with them in the fiery furnace and did indeed deliver them. The burning fiery furnace that was heated seven times will likewise have a double worldwide spiritual application in the very end in the experiences of spiritual Israel who will be brought into unimaginable problems, trials in the very end. And as the Lord's presence was with the three Hebrews, so will the Lord by his angels walk with his people in the worldwide spiritual fiery furnace and will indeed deliver them, I should say us, because I believe that we will go through that time. So we see the connection between the deliverance of the three Hebrews and the deliverance of God's worldwide spiritual Israel, as we find mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, which says, Daniel 12, verse 1, the Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Every one that should be found written in the book. So again, we find this theme of deliverance all throughout the Bible. And especially in the book of Daniel. God's heart is set on delivering his people. And for that, we praise God, especially in these days where there's so much fear and, and confusion, and especially in what's coming in the future. We don't have to worry or guess at anything. We know how it ends. God's people will be delivered. And for that, we say, praise God. But there, there's so much here. We find that the same anti-typical application is seen in the plot of Daniel's enemies to bring him into conflict with the law of the land and have him branded as being a traitor to the nation and deserving of death. I quote Great Controversy, page 591, which says, While Satan seeks to destroy those who honor God's law, he will cause them to be accused as lawbreakers, as men who are dishonoring God and bringing judgments upon the world. And I firmly believe, my friends, that in a very short time, God's people, we are going to be called the terrorists. We're going to be called those that are causing the problems of the world. We're going to be called uh, not having tolerance, unloving, unkind, hateful, whatever it is out there these days. We shall be accused of all that. It goes on. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. Now watch this. In legislative halls, 
and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. A false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their motives. And in many ways, that day is already here. Because today, if we stand up for biblical truth, for example, if we stand up for biblical marriage, we're called haters. We're called having no love. We're, we're, we're accused of not being tolerant just because we stand up for biblical truth. But we're going to be condemned, misrepresented. So the crisis which faced Daniel and the three Hebrews, the choice of obeying the law of God or the law of the state typifies the crisis that will come to the remnant church when Sunday laws are enforced by the state. But us, we, Sabbath keepers, we will be so committed to the Lord, we'll be so in love with Jesus that our experience will be just like that of the three Hebrews. You see, going back to Daniel 3, in Daniel 3, when the king threatened them that if they don't bow, they're going to be thrown in the fire, uh, we find that the three Hebrews responded by saying the following words. Daniel 3.16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful of answering this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. You know, that part right there, that does not impress me at all. It doesn't. I mean, come on, my friends. If I knew that God was going to take me out of the fire, I'd jump in the fire. Amen. What impresses me is what they said next. Verse 18. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. In other words, king, our God that we serve, he is able to deliver us, and we believe he will deliver us out of your fire. But if our God, in his divine wisdom, if, in his divine will, if he sees fit, that it's best that we burn in your fire, be it known unto you, O king, we'd rather burn in your fire than live in dishonor to our God. In other words, We'd rather die than sin against our God. And us in the last days will be so in love with our Lord that our attitude, our experience will be the same. We'd rather die than disobey our God. And once we have that love for the Lord, that unshakable commitment, we may be assured of deliverance, as was Daniel in his hour of test. Because Daniel, though plunged into what appeared to his enemies to be certain death, Daniel passed that night in the lion's den, trusting in his God. And with the morning light of a new day, it revealed to the king and to Daniel's enemies that Daniel had been indeed delivered. And passing through a very similar experience to that of Daniel, God's last day Israel, after being plunged into a period of affliction and distress that no human pen can picture, they too will place their complete trust in God. And they too will be delivered at the time when the sixth plague merges into the seventh plague. And now, we're entering into the heart of this study. Because contrary to popular opinion, God's people are not delivered at the second coming of Christ. But we're delivered before 
the second coming of Christ, when the sixth plague merges into the seventh plague. This is an awesome study. The how we are delivered is what we want to take a look at in this series. How is it that we are delivered prior to the actual second coming of Christ? And this is beautifully revealed all throughout Scripture. But that we may understand and see this in its entire context, I would like for us to take a quick look at the entire chapter of Daniel 3. You see, Daniel 3, it contains one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. But usually when we hear Daniel 3, we hear it in the context of a children's story, in the context of, you know, while and the three Hebrews did not bow down the image, they trusted in God, and God delivered them. And if we're faithful, God delivers us also. And all that's true. But in Daniel chapter 3, we find a sequence of events, a prophetic outline that tells us in many great and exciting details exactly what's going to happen in these last days. In other words, everything we find in Daniel chapter 3 has an end time worldwide fulfillment. So let's go to Daniel chapter 3. And as we read, I want us to notice the sequence of events that we find in Daniel 3. Because it's going to set the stage for the entire series. So let's go there. Daniel 3 verse 1. The Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth of six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So the first thing we find here in Daniel 3 in the sequence of events is that the king of Babylon, he makes an image. Bear that in mind. The sequence of events. He makes an image. Verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the next thing here is everyone is gathered together at the dedication of this image. Look at the sequence now. The king makes an image. They're all gathered. Verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kind of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So the next thing is, we find there's a decree to worship this image. Verse 6. And whoso falls not down and worships shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So not only is there a decree to worship, you find a death decree. If you don't worship to the fire, you will go. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. So you'll notice, the next thing is, the Jews are accused. Why are they accused? Because they're not worshiping the image. Everyone is worshiping. Everyone's bowing down. But these three Hebrews stand up. And because of that, they are accused. Verse 9. They spoke and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree 
that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sigma, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falls not down and worships, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fire furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded you. They serve not your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. King, they're not bowing. They don't care about your God, your law, your decree. They're accused. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Notice the sequence now. They're denounced, accused, and now they stand before the king. And why? To answer as to why it is that they are not bowing down to the image that he has set up. Verse 15. 14. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you'll be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fire furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Notice, what is the king offering them? What's the king offering them? He's offering them a second chance. I, I could just imagine the king telling them, come on, guys, come on, fellas, work with me here. Don't make me be a bad guy. Work with me. If you bow down, I'm afraid of this whole thing ever happened. The king is being very generous in giving them a second opportunity. Another sequence. 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful of answering this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. In other words, king, we don't need a second chance. We don't got to think about it. Our minds are made up. We will not bow. In other words, these three Jews were faithful. They wouldn't bow. Now remember, my friends, every detail here has an end time application. Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Two things here. Not only did Nebuchadnezzar become furious, but his face changed. His face changed. Look at the sequence now. Jews are faithful. King becomes furious. His face changes. And he spoke and commanded they should heat the furnace seven times hotter than it was to be heated. Fire the furnace seven times. Verse 20. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound to their coats, their hose, and their hats, and other garments, and were cast into the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, and the flame of the fire slew, that the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Very important principle here. The fires heated seven times. And by the way, you know what they did probably, right? Uh, I, I am told that you can make fire hotter. They didn't have that technology back then, but chances are, you know what they did? I mean, in what modern-day country is Babylon located? 
Iraq. What natural resource is found in Iraq? Oil. You think that oil got there last week? That oil has been there, that oil has been there for centuries. More than likely, they threw more oil in there, make it bigger, hotter. But the point is, the fire that was meant to kill the three Hebrews, that fire killed the enemies of the Hebrews. Don't miss that point. We're going to come all back to this in the series. The fire that was meant to kill the Hebrews, that fire killed the enemies of the Hebrews. Verse 24. Oh, 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the midst of the burning fire furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So the next thing on the sequence is the king sees Jesus. Now question, how did the king recognize Jesus? He said, I, I, I threw three men, I see four, and that fourth is like the Son of God. How did the king recognize Jesus? This took place 600 years or so before Christ was born. They didn't have paintings and pictures of Christ we have today, and, and, I, and I promise you, Christ looked nothing like those paintings we have today. But how did he recognize Jesus? Keep reading. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fire furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come out. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Very important question. When was it that the three Hebrews were delivered from the fire? When? Some say the moment they went in. Well, the presence of Jesus air-conditioned the furnace. So they were preserved in the fire by the presence of Jesus. But follow me now. They were not delivered from the fire until the king spoke and said, come on out. So they were delivered at the voice of the king. Verse 27. And the princes, governors, captains, kings, counselors gathered together, saw these men upon whose, whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was the hair of their head singed, neither were coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed upon them. 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So the very last thing that we find here is the king of Babylon blesses the true God of heaven. These are the sequence of events that took place some 26, 2700 years ago in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, we don't have time to go through everything here in detail, but everything on this list of events has an end time, worldwide, spiritual application. So let's get into it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, and let's go to verse 11. The Bible says, And I beheld another beast come out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, 
and spoke as a dragon. Now question, we know who this beast is. We're not going to identify this beast right now, but we know who it is. But here's the question. This second beast, is it a worldwide power? Yes or no? Absolutely. How do we know? Look at verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and then the dweller in to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this second beast has enough power, enough authority, enough muscle to command the entire world to worship not itself, but to worship the first beast. Has enough power that when it speaks, the entire world listens and obeys. So question, Babylon, was Babylon a world power? Yes or no? Absolutely. The second beast, is it a world power? Yes or no? Absolutely. Babylon made an image. What's the second beast going to do? Verse 14. And deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by the sword, and did live. So the second beast is going to cause all to make an image to the beast. 15. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So we find that there's going to be a decree to worship the image and a death decree for those who don't worship the image. You worship, you live. You don't worship, you die. And in Daniel 3, how many worshiped the image? How many? All. And in the last days, how many are going to worship the image? All. How do we know? Look at verse 8. Chapter 13, verse 8. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from, from the foundation of the world. So everyone on the planet will worship the image except those whose names are written in the book of life. And just as the three Hebrews, for their faithfulness, were accused, denounced, God's people are also going to be accused and denounced. For what? For not bowing down to the image of the beast. Now remember, Daniel 3, it's a literal image. It was a literal gathering. In the last days, it is now a spiritual image. There's a spiritual gathering going on. But when God's people were accused in Daniel 3, where were they taken? Where were they brought to? They were brought before the king to give a reason as to why it is that they don't bow down to the image. So in the last days, when God's people are accused for not bowing down to the image, where are we going to be taken to? Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We read beginning in verse 16. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, Matthew 10, 16, the Bible says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. We too are going to be brought before legislative bodies, 
before courts, before tribunals, to give a reason, an answer as to why it is that we are not bowing down to the image. And let me pause here, my friends, because it's so very important. You see, if we are not right now preparing for this moment, the moment in which you and I must stand before courts, before legislative bodies, and by, by via, te via technology, before the entire world, to give a reason why it is that we're not bowing down, to give a reason for why it is what we believe, what we believe. If right now we're not preparing and filling our minds with the word of God in preparation for that time, when that time comes, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. And my friends, please, let's not deceive ourselves. If we are not preparing right now for that event by filling our hearts and minds with the word of God, believe it or not, we will bow to that image. And let me tell you something, my friends. In God's church today, in God's church today, Bible study is at an all-time low. A few years ago, I was at a, speaking at a church somewhere in this country, United States. It was a big church. It, it was actually in the afternoon, but there were still about two, 300 people there. It was a large church. And, and I decided to give the church a pop quiz. I actually passed out papers and pencils. And I asked five simple questions. Question number one was, excluding the fourth commandment. Please give me five scriptures that teach the Sabbath truth. Five. Now, for us as Seventh-day Adventists, that should be easy. We should do that in our sleep. And in that large congregation, less than 20 were able to do so. My friends, we're not ready. There's a statement that we find in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 5, page 707. And that statement reads as follows. This is serious. I quote, I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. Wow. Many who go to church faithfully every Sabbath don't have a knowledge of present truth, don't fully understand what we believe. And what is it, my friends, that we believe that makes us unique? The Sabbath, the state of the dead, the spirit of prophecy. The sanctuary, investigative judgment, righteousness by faith, the health message. It goes on. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. Wow. Until we're tested and forced to stand alone, many will not realize that they do not know the truth that they professed to believe. And why is that? Because in this time, we did not prepare. We put other things before the study of the Word of God. 
and there's many who don't understand the truth that we hold. It goes on. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain it is that there's been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human in place of divine wisdom. You see, my friends, we cannot be satisfied with our knowledge of the Word of God. We must dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And we cannot be having simple little 30-second, one-minute, two-minute devotions in the morning and believe that that's all we need. No, my friends, we need to dig in the Word of God more than ever before. It's so another statement that we find in the Spirit of Prophecy, found in the book of Evangelism. Evangelism, where she's to page 69, where she tells us something very, very important. You see, she tells us that the greatest minds in this world are going to severely criticize every position that you and I hold dear as Seventh-day Adventist. And if it could be picked apart to pieces, it will. She tells us that right now, we as Adventists are hardly noticed. We're hardly a, a blip on the radar, but that is soon to change. And I do believe that very soon you, you're going to see many of God's people on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News standing in defense of God's truth. But if we have not been preparing for that time, it will be too late. You know, years ago, the Lord taught me a serious lesson. For, for many years, actually since I was 16 years old, I began to study the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known as the Mormons, more commonly. And I delved into that, and I still do. I, I, lo I love doing it. I mean, I, I, I drank the dregs of Mormonism. And there was a period in my life that for about eight months, on a weekly basis, I had between eight to 12 missionaries in my home studying with me, more mis more, Mormon missionaries. And the highest ranking Mormon that I studied with at that time, he was actually the temple elect president of the temple, the Mormon temple in Santa Monica, which at that time was the largest temple in the world. I studied with him for about eight months. Very smart man. To make a long story short, I got a call from Salt Lake City, the capital of the Mormon world. And they flat out asked me, why am I, literally, why am I confusing their missionaries and why have I not, have I not accepted the truth? We spoke. My house was banned. Missionaries were no longer allowed to come to my house. I was blacklisted by Salt Lake City. And many years went by, and one day I get a knock on my door, and I open the door, and I see these two young men with their little name tags here. Oh, elders, how you doing? Come on in. Surprised. I was banned. It's been at least probably five years went by. And we began talking about the state of the dead. After Ecclesiastics 9, 5, and 6, they had nothing to say. But then one of them told me, you know what, Brother Gomez, we'll be honest with you. We can't answer your question. But we know someone who can. If you're willing to talk to that person, I promise you he'll answer whatever question you have. Will you talk to him? I said, yeah, sure. Why not? Okay, next week at this time, we'll bring him by. Okay, the, the day arrived. I get a phone call in the morning. Listen, um... Because of this and this and that, he cannot come. He's wondering if he could go to his house. I said, okay, sure. Okay, we'll come by and, and we'll, we, you can follow us to the house. Okay, when I heard the phone, immediately the Lord told me, mistake. You made a mistake. 
Never go to their sphere of influence. Always bring them to your sphere of influence. But I already made the commitment. I said, Lord, what do I do? The Lord told me, don't go alone. Okay, who do I take? I call my dad, very knowledgeable, consecrated man. Okay, I, I, I explain the situation. He said, all right, fine, let, let's go. They, they come, we, we get in the car, we follow them. We get to the house, get out of the car, knock on that man's door. The moment that man opened the door, every hair on my body stood. I got chills. And I'm like, what did I just get myself into? The vibe that I just got when you opened the door, I was like, whoa, so this is not right. We walk in the door. I look to my left, and I see his bookshelf, this library, and I'm like, uh-oh, I have these books. He's reading what I'm reading. We sit down, and the first words that come out of his mouth were, my name is such and such. I've been a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for 18 years, and I'm a Freemason. When he said that, I was like, whoa, whoa, okay. What degree of Freemasonry are you? 30 seconds. Now, if you know Freemasonry, there's only 30, 33 degrees. He's 30 seconds. Freemasonry is a Luciferian society, a cultic society, very demonic. 32nd degree, I'm about to study the Bible with a man that when he opens the Bible, he is directly under the influence of Satan himself. We sit down, and he says, listen, you're my guest. we got two hours. I'll give you the first hour. You give me the second hour. Agreed? Mistake number two, always let them go first. But for one hour, my friends, for one hour, I went to work. I gave every text on the state of the dead you could think of. After the one hour, literally, he does this. Are you finished? Well, yeah. Now, I was ready for the typical apps for the body, present with the Lord, spirits in prison. But my friends, with one text, he undid everything that I spent one hour doing. I've never in my life have heard that. I, I did this, I did this, I went this, and that would be, clearly, I had no answer. And what bugs me to this day, it bothered me so much, is that those two young missionaries, they left that meeting more grounded and confirmed in their false religion because of my ignorance and my weakness. I went home, embarrassed, humiliated, frustrated, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, my faith is not shaken. I know we have the truth, but there has to be an answer to this. There has to be an answer. And I spent about a month studying and praying until finally the Lord <laughs> showed me the answer. I was like, oh my goodness, this is so simple. The point is, if we're not preparing right now, to stand in defense of God's truth in a very short time. If we're not filling our hearts and minds with the word of God, we won't be ready. And don't expect God to zap us with the knowledge that we have not spent time preparing and studying for. And my friends, we're almost there. Because truth is under attack from all around us. 
and we will be brought before great bodies, legislative bodies, powerful assemblies to give a reason why we're not bowing down, bowing down to the image. But, going back to now three real quick, the three Hebrews, as they were brought before the king, they were offered a second chance, a second opportunity. Bow down and live. God's people in the last days, we too are going to be offered a second opportunity to avoid being in problems with the law. We'll be offered higher wages, long weekends, other incentives, whatever it takes. Just go along with the mark, the image of the beast. Go along with it. But just like the three Hebrews who were so in love with their God, God's people in the last days, because we took the time to prepare and had that intimate walk with the Lord, we too will be like, you know what? Doesn't matter how nice or how mean you are. Doesn't matter what you offer me. There's nothing that will get me to dishonor my God. Now in Daniel 3, when the king saw that no matter how nice he was, no matter how courteous he was or how mean he was, when he saw that these three Hebrews would not bow, what happened to the king? He became furious. Furious. And his face changed. So here's the question. When the world sees, when the beast sees that God's people will not bow to the image, how is King Nebuchadnezzar's fury going to be repeated in the very end of time against God's people? How? That is where we'll continue in the next part of this series. My friends, it's going to get excited from here and here or not, I promise you. Word of God is awesome, powerful. Please, let's continue studying this amazing truth. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to have this series, this presentation. Father, please help us, Lord, to study your word as never before, to learn of you, to learn who Jesus is, and to intimately walk with him by spending time daily in your word that we can be ready to stand in defense of your truth in these last days. Bless us as we continue this series, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.